All right, Senator, thank you so much for joining me. I, I know we don't have uh, too much time together today, but I wanted to uh, talk to you about a few topics. Um, first, let's start with Bill C-11. So my goal here, I, I simply want to bring more awareness of this bill to the average person, because I think it is very important. Uh, un unfortunately, though, for the vast majority of people, they don't know what C-11 is. They've never heard of it. And of course, don't know the implications it has for them. So as the chair of the, the Standing Senate Committee on Transport and Communications, uh, which is overseeing this bill, can you help describe what C-11 is in layman terms so people understand and why it's problematic for all Canadians? Thank you and, and glad to be with you uh, today, Costa. Uh, C-11, and currently it is the third reading in the Senate, um, so it's gone through a long process. And you're absolutely right. Uh, it is a bill people should become aware of because it's a bill that affects everyone across the country, particularly young people. It's a, a feeble attempt on the part of the government to reform the Broadcasting Act, and they say to modernize it because the Broadcasting Act has not been reformed or, or amended or modernized in many decades. But in essence, what C-11 does, it is trying to take modern communication platforms, which all Canadians use, TikTok, Facebook, uh, YouTube, um, Snapchat, all of these new platforms that give us the opportunity to communicate quickly, efficiently, and effectively. The government wants to bring them into line and wants the CRTC and a bunch of gatekeeper bureaucrats in Ottawa to regulate what Canadians can post on these platforms, what they can read by forcing these platforms to use algorithms to meet standards that are determined by those bureaucrats in the CRTC. It's a terrible bill and all Canadians who believe in free speech uh, should be concerned. So yeah, th that's what you said there. Like that's a point that, that concerns me, right? I, I can understand the, the, the concept of promoting Canadian content. Sure. But, but deemed the content deemed like appropriate by who, like, are we talking about like just whoever's in charge in government at the time or? Absolutely, because at the end of the day, even though the CRTC is an arm's length organization, the chair, the board, they're all appointed by cabinet. They're all appointed, appointed today by Prime Minister Trudeau. And at the end of the day, we know we look at CanCon, uh, you know, today, Canadian content, it's determined by bureaucrats and determined by the CRTC. And you're right. I mean, uh, we are Canadians right now. We're talking about Canadian issues. We're on the air. You have an opportunity to, through these platforms to reach out to millions of people, not only in Canada and around the world, but who's to say that the CRTC determines tomorrow the subject matter that we're dealing with doesn't meet their requirements. And then they tell your platform providers that these are the algorithmic principles or, or um, rules that you have to follow in order to promote one broadcast over another or one podcast over another or what is allowed to be shown on these platforms or what is it? I feel like that's such an easy concept to grasp, right? Even like proponents uh, of the bill who support it, right? Um, who's to say for 10, 15 years from now, uh, government officials aren't, are gonna be in place that are against their line of thinking. So so this, this although they're for this bill today, it could work against them in the future, right? Like it's such Absolutely. an easy concept. And, and, and my view has nothing to do with partisan politics. I believe yeah. that freedom is freedom is freedom, freedom mm -hmm. of speech and the ability to articulate what you believe in should be done in an unfettered fashion like we're doing here today. It's not being edited. It, there's no conditions attached to our discussion. You're talking to an individual. You're asking me questions. I'm going to respond to them as openly as possible. And I think the best way for democracy to function is to have the, these type of dialogues be unfettered doesn't matter if you're coming from the left of the political spectrum or the right of the political spectrum. I'm a defender of freedom and free speech, not only for those that agree with me, but particularly I defend the right of those that disagree with me. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. I, I, I want to help clear maybe some misconceptions with the bill. So, for example, right, someone like myself who has this podcast, uh, I broadcast conversations I have with people all over the Internet. So... How, if at all, could this bill affect me and, and my independent little media channel here? Well, look, it all depends how the CRTC want to regulate it. And 
That's why we tried to put forward a lot of amendments. We've, put, we've proposed 27 amendments already to the bill as we've sent it back to the Senate for a final vote, actually, when we resume Parliament next week. Uh, and and we, we, we are basically asking the government, we're pleading with them in order to solve some of these issues. For example, Canadian digital uh, content uh, providers in this country, they want to have security that they know that the CRTC won't determine you know, if they're Canadian enough to be aired or not to be aired, that they will not have a situation where the CRTC creates standards where their podcast, their videos, whatever they may be. We have right now a Canadian content policy in this country where very many products, when I say products, films, documentaries, shows, are being filmed in Canada. They're using Canadian actors. They're using Canadian writers. They're using Canadian directors, producers, shot in Canadian settings. But yet because the production uh, company that finances the project comes from Paris or Los Angeles, we don't consider it Canadian content. It's this kind of inconsistency in the modern world that concerns content providers and the people in the digital world. And they're saying, you know, just because Canadians are no longer paying attention to traditional broadcasters like Bell, like CBC, and I'm not making this up. All you got to do is look at the ratings. The digital world is exploding. Podcasts, unfettered free shows like this that are on the air for Indigenous Canadians, for uh, LGBTQ Canadians, for people that express political opinions from various political spectrums. We see an explosion in communication capacity in this country because of these platforms. And all of a sudden, the government says, wait a minute, we need to regulate them and bring them into line to the traditional broadcasting model, which no longer works. You see it in the ratings and you see why a lot of these traditional broadcasters are struggling to survive. Yeah. Um, so what what I'm hearing is a lot of uh, like openness and broadness and like, you know, for there's room for interpretation. In the last few years, we've seen a lot of censorship happening with social media on Twitter, Facebook from, um, you know, people getting censored for, for whatever reasons. How does this bill then make censorship uh, easier if, if whoever's in charge deems certain content inappropriate? Absolutely. The CRTC has far reaching powers in the old Broadcasting Act. They maintain them and they're even made broader in C-11. And at the end of the day, I don't believe it's for any bureaucrat or an appointed individual or an elected individual for that matter to determine what can be posted, not be posted. And I'll give a specific example. Uh, just last year, Radio Canada, the French arm of CBC, a journalist used a word that was deemed to be not an acceptable word, a very bad word, a very derogatory, pejorative word when it comes to uh, referring to colored people. There was an outcry. That individual, that journalist was fired. That program, that content was taken down as per a ruling of the CRTC. Now, if the CRTC has that power, and again, like I said, freedom of speech is also to allow people to express themselves when they disagree or when they say things that are uh, not acceptable to society. But let society deem what that is acceptable and what isn't. Not 10 individuals sitting around the table. I'm not condoning the word that was used in this particular case, but I'm not condoning either the right of the CRCC to determine what is uh, egregious and what is not egregious. Yeah, totally agree. I mean... You know, like, why not? Like, and again, I get the point of promoting Canadian content. That seems to be like the main argument. But, you know, I see it as and I'm also a firm believer in, in freedom of, of speech and just the ability for people to to do what they want. Um, but like, why not promote Canadian businesses instead and just help up help prop up Canadian media better to compete in the global market like if if independent media and filmmakers from canada do good then people will watch right like that makes more sense than shoving content down people's throats that bureaucrats deem appropriate right i i uh, i totally agree with you and i go a step further i don't want government to promote anything i don't believe yeah. the canadian culture and canadian content is is incapable 
of competing in the world. I think we have shown in the music industry, in the film industry, in the our, all our artists of, of all realms in this country are spectacular, are capable, are talented. They have succeeded in each and every one of these areas. So I believe government should get out of the way and give these, these opportunities. And that's what these platforms provide, the YouTubes, the TikToks, the, the Twitters. The, they provide an opportunity to Canadian artists like The Weeknd, to others who have been discovered on these platforms, Justin Bieber, that have taken Canadian, our Canadian success stories in the cultural world around the world. We had before our Senate Affairs, our Senate Transport and Communications Committee, Indigenous groups come before us and say, please amend C-11 and make sure that the government gets out of our way because in the last two decades, we have had exposure to the world of Indigenous Canadian culture through these platforms that we never have had before when we had to go before Telefilm Canada and before the, the gatekeepers at Bell and CBC to determine that if what I am doing as an artist deserve to be put on air or not. So yeah. at the end of the day, uh, there, is n there, there has been no greater time to be an artist than 2023. The movie industry, the music industry is booming in Toronto and rural parts of Canada because of this, these platforms, because of these also production companies and investors that believe in Canadian culture. So there's this myth that all oh, we're doing this to promote Canadian culture and to protect Canadian culture. Well, Canadian culture hasn't shown in the last couple of decades that it needs protection. It's growing. So let it be. Get out of it. Unleash our capacity and our potential and get government out of the way. Yeah, uh, that's well said. I, I, like Canadian people deserve more credit, right? We, we can. We don't need that uh, that babysitting for for what we should watch. Um, so, what are the? I love to like get the other sides. So like, what are the main arguments for for people that support this bill? Like, you know, how are they arguing this? Like, how can this be a good thing for Canadians? Look, I think there's been such a, a habit that has developed in Ottawa by the bureaucrats that they believe they know best. They don't have faith in the Canadian people to determine that they can post things that are worthy of being watched. And what's even worse, they don't think the Canadian public has enough uh, common sense to determine what they think is best to watch for themselves. So they want to determine these, uh, these issues for Canadians. And I think that's, that's completely wrong. The other element in all this, which is the truth, they will deny it, of course, that C11 is all about the money. The truth of the matter is these new platforms have created hundreds of thousands of independent journalists in Canada, independent shows in Canada, of bloggers and streamers that are posting things and, and are getting millions of followers. And you know what? Thank you very much. They have created a wonderful business for themselves. And thank you very much. The government should be grateful because when these bloggers and streamers are making money and they're monetizing their success as artists and as streamers, and you know what it does? It brings more revenue to the coffers of the Canadian government. Mm -hmm. So even, even then, we don't appreciate the fact that we should be patting him on the back, giving him more liberties in order to generate more success, to generate more revenue. But instead, their preoccupation, and I've said this publicly and I stand by it, is the fact that... The traditional broadcasters are losing ground. Their model isn't working. They want to find new sources of revenue and they want to essentially steal it from these platforms and more importantly, from these Canadian independent uh, digital people and streamers and bloggers who are successful. And that is completely wrong and unacceptable. And I, I've argued over the last couple of years, how many bloggers and streamers and, and, and people from the digital world today are running to transform their model into what traditional broadcasters are doing. And how many traditional broadcasters, Quebec or CBC, Bell Media, Global, are running to transform their business model into a digital platform and to, and to benefit from what the digital world offers them? So that in itself is a testament that these new platforms, are ha they have much more reach, but let them work. Let the public determine if what they're being fed, what they're being, what they're being shown, is worthy of being shown. I don't want anyone going onto my into my phone and into my 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 iPads 
and determining what pops up as a priority to watch. Yeah. I want it to be determined uh, in, a, in, a, in a natural way based on what my interests are, which is what's going on right now. Absolutely. Yeah. It, it, it seems like a crazy thing to even debate. Um, what's, what's the latest status of this bill and like how, how likely is it from actually passing? It's unfortunate, but it's where, where we have done all we can to amend the bill, to uh, give voice to those in this country that are concerned about the bill. There, were, uh, there was a, a short process of review over in the House side. The government, the Trudeau government, did whatever they can in order to create obstacles for streamers and bloggers and, uh, and independent um, digital content um, generators to be heard. I'm proud that on the Senate side, we had a long study that lasted a number of months. We heard over 125 witnesses. Uh, so every voice, pro and con, got an opportunity to, to be heard. 27 amendments, which is an enormous amount of amendments, which shows how flawed, deeply flawed this bill is. Uh, now we're third reading before the chamber. I wish that the bill altogether was defeated and the government was sent back to the drawing board, but the Senate today is dominated by Trudeau appointed senators. Since 2015, he has uh, the vast majority of the senators right now are his appointees. We're only a conservative caucus of 15. We're putting up a, a, a good and strong fight for freedom and freedom of expression. Uh, but in the end, I will be shocked if these Trudeau appointees showed some independence because they claim that they're not partisan. They claim that Trudeau appointees have come to the Senate and have saved our parliament and they've saved the Senate because they're independent. But that hasn't been proven in their voting track record. And I suspect they will overwhelmingly support Bill C-11 as well. And in the end, this deeply flawed bill will become law. The only way to reverse this terribly egregious bill is to make sure in the next federal election, we elect a majority Pierre Polyev led conservative government. And I know and he's made it crystal clear that this will be amongst one of the first bills that we would repeal. Yeah, that's that's unfortunate that it's um, it, it, it got this far. Um, I feel like it's a it's it's a dark chapter in, in Canadian history that the fact that this is actually going to be law very soon or like the only thing uh, worse than this in my uh, 14 years as a senator uh, Costa is the emergency measures act, mm -hmm. which Justin Trudeau, of course, uh, put into place unnecessarily in the most draconian way and complete overreach again on civil rights in this country and freedom mm -hmm. of, of expression and freedom of speech and freedom of association. Uh, and, and of course he follows it up with Bill C-11, which is consistent with this Trudeau government. Uh, they, they spoke in 2014 about more openness, more transparency, more accountability, but there has never been a government that has been less open, less transparent, than this government has. And every time there's opposing voices, they try at all costs to find mechanisms to shut down that opposition dialogue. Yeah, it's uh, crazy times. Speaking of that, um, you know, leading into the sort of next question I want to ask, so I'd love to get your perspective on just the current state of affairs in our country, right? You, you were appointed to the Senate in 2008 and involved with government even before that. I don't recall ever in this country uh, being as divided as it is right now in every aspect, right? From social issues, politics, you know, families being divided, economic divide. It's clear there's there's a massive division, but it's also just as clear that there's no attempt from the leaders of the country to, to bring people together and, and unite people. In fact, it, it kind of almost feels the opposite, where, where leaders are trying to kind of like create even more wedges and widen the division. Uh, so what do you think is causing this level of division? Like what's what's the agenda behind it? Why do you think this is happening? And, and how can we close that gap again and be a little bit more united as a country? Look, we went through a terrible crisis with COVID, uh, but it pales by comparison in terms of what this uh, current existential crisis we're going through right now in Canada, which is, a broken economy. Uh, Canadians across the country, coast to coast to coast, uh, have seen that nothing is working. 
we're being taxed more than ever before and we've been provided less services than ever before and all you need to do is go through an airport for a family trip or more importantly as many canadians need to go through airports for work and you realize it's chaos you try to get a passport either for travel or for business purposes it's chaos you look at what, what's going on with our immigration department try to get an appointment at revenue canada and see what you have to go through uh, things are not working in this country. We have had now umpteen number of cases with this Trudeau government where they break the law, they've broken the ethics law because of uh, corruption, essentially, giving contracts for family members. Prime Minister Trudeau giving hundreds of millions of dollars to an organization that had his wife and mother and brother on the payroll. And there seems to be this, this reflex developing in the country that as long as a government does something as corrupt as this and apologizes and says, well, this time around, try to do better next time around. I'm sorry for it, that it happened. Uh, it, it, it's not enough. There has to be accountability. And Canadians who are paying more, as I said at the beginning, and getting less in return are saying to themselves, wait a minute, it doesn't make sense. I'm being fleeced at every turn. I go to the grocery store now because I need to feed my children. And I'm being fleeced. I need to buy shoes to be able to send my kids to school. I'm being fleeced. I need to buy school supplies for my children. I'm being fleeced. I go to the gas pump because I need to, to fill up my car to be able to drive my children to school and to a soccer practice. I'm being fleeced. So as this continues, this tension continues to grow. And as the, the Canadians continue to recognize how broken the country is, and we have a prime minister who, instead of recognizing that his economic strategy of spending and taxing have failed and that we need some kind of fiscal e accountability in this country and responsibility, and they refuse to, uh, we see interest rates now exploding at record highs we haven't seen in three decades because of the free spending and, and overtaxing policies, monetary policies of this Trudeau government. Uh, which they thought that they can get away with because there would be long lasting low interest rates. And now here we are facing this existential crisis. Uh, and we have a prime minister who intentionally divides Canadians. We saw in an interview last week who himself points to race and identifies a certain racial group, white men, as something being evil. I thought we've turned the page in this country when it comes to identifying people based on their color and their creed, and their religion. I believe, always have from a young age, we are both children of immigrants, Costa. Mm -hmm. And I'm an immigrant. I, I'm, I represent all kinds of minorities as a senator from Quebec. And I believe that we would have reached our, in 2023, a real level of, of, of uh, success by becoming colorblind, by becoming religious blind, by turning the page and treating every single Canadian equal and making sure that there's equality of opportunity for all. And we have a prime minister who's race baiting. He's identifying a particular gender and a particular color and saying, this is a terrible thing. How irresponsible can a prime minister of Canada be? A country that has always prided itself on our multi-ethnicity, our multi-faith, our freedom, and our openness. It's, it's honestly, it's very concerning for, you know, I can speak for myself, and but I know I can speak for thousands, if not millions of other Canadians as well, right? I have two young kids, one on the way, and just everything you describe, like I'm, I'm genuinely concerned about the future that my kids are going to have in this country. Like we're, we're, on, we're going on a path right now, which, and I don't see it reversing or getting better. Like it, it's just getting deeper and deeper. So you know, like, how does this end up? Like, what, what are your concerns? Like, how do you see this playing well, out for, for the my next concern generation? Is we, you know, we have a bunch of drunken sailors in government since 2015 that have never had a year where they balanced uh, the budget. Uh, they have added to the national debt at levels never seen before. Right now, the debt has surpassed our total annual economic output. And this prime minister who acts like he, he's been given his dad's credit card for the weekend, doesn't want to reel it in. If we listen to him and Christia Freeland, they've been doubling down now for the last few months, as we've been seeing sign after sign after sign that inflation will explode, and now it has. And we've seen 
for years now, Pierre Polyev and other uh, r rational politicians have been predicting that if we continue down this path, we're going to have explosive interest rates, which will launch us into a recession, which will give us prolonged economic pain. That's where we are. And now around the corner, despite the fact that we're paying more than ever and getting less than ever, we also have a situation and a grave situation that's coming around the corner that our social system in this country, what Canadians have pri prided themselves on is Medicare, free education, and the ability to have a social security net to help those who are left behind because we as Canadians are very compassionate. And yeah, this is a conservative talking about Medicare and talking about free education and talking about the social security net. But the only way to maintain these important principles and structure in this country is to create wealth and to be fiscally responsible. And no, you can't spend like a drunken sailor. And Prime Minister Trudeau has put all those things at risk for Canadians for the decades that are coming around the corner. Yeah, and that, that leads into uh, the next thing I want to ask you about or get your uh, opinion on. So something else, uh, this really bothers me to the core, right? It is when I hear about the, the wasted spending that happens within government that we all know about, right? Uh, these inflated budgets, just incompetence, and just like the sheer waste that's happening. This is no, this is nothing new to anyone. And I'm bringing this up because we, we, we just learned the other day about the, the details surrounding the $54 million Arrive Can disaster. And you know, although this is just the one of, of countless examples of wasted spending, this one drives me crazy in particular because um, I've been in the software space for the last 12 years. So I know what it takes to build, develop software. And just the thought of spending $54 million for, for a piece of software that essentially provided no value whatsoever to me and like to many others is just like totally unfathomable. Like I can't even put it into perspective. But besides that example, like the reason wasted spending bothers me so much is because I'm an entrepreneur, right? I started with nothing, no handouts, just like yourself, come from immigrant, blue collar working parents from Greece, um, you know, nothing through and through nothing but hard work, dedication, just doing the right things, having the right values. I've been able to slowly build something for myself, which every Canadian has the same opportunity to do. And so as Canadians, we already pay some of the highest taxes. Uh, like you said, we got fleeced like left, right and center. Uh, and so when I take a step back now and reflect on how hard I've worked to build up what I have and provide for my family and pay my share, very fair share of taxes, and then and then see how little care and respect the government has for my hard earned tax dollars. Like that just doesn't sit well with me. Like just just speaking about this really makes my blood boil almost. And so like, I don't even know if there's a solution for this or whether this is just so embedded into government nowadays, but, but how do we start like correcting this and actually holding incompetent people accountable for this, this waste? Well, look, I'm glad you brought up Arrive Can because I've been asking questions of the government leader in the Senate for a very long time, for a couple of years now, and I uh, Arrive Can, and it's funny, Costa, because I call Arrive Can, Arrive Can't. Because number one, it, it's inefficient, it's ineffective, and as we know full well, it doesn't. Uh, it's not applicable to every single Canadian uh, as well. Which and it, it's also discriminatory for that matter, because there's a lot of senior citizens, uh, yeah. who many of them are snowbirds and they travel down south uh, because of their retirement in the winter time and what have you, that come back and don't have the capacity to use a Rife Can, right? Because they're not online. Uh, you know, my, my 88 year old dad doesn't have the capacity to use a Rive can because he's just not a digital guy. And there's a whole generation of those Canadians. Mm -hmm. Um, and the fact that we've seen now a number, we've seen recently a globe and mail story of a number of consultants, both it consultants and other type of consultants that are abusing taxpayer dollars. And they're essentially being hired for hired for reasons unknown to do the job of bureaucrats that we've already hired. During COVID, Justin Trudeau hired thousands of extra bureaucrats and we have more bureaucracy in 2023 than we did in 2025. And yet again, the services seem to be diminishing. In any business, in your household, if you spend $200,000 uh, 
uh, in any given fiscal year above and beyond your annual budget to do renovations in your house. And yet after you do that, everything's still decrepit. The doors are falling apart. There's a problem with the driveway. The roof is leaking. You say to yourself, where did the $200,000 go? And somebody, your wife would be holding you to account probably cost of saying, Hey, I mean, you, you were spending, you spent all this money and you said you were fixing the house, but the house is a mess. Uh, we saw a few months ago, the auditor general did a review of COVID aid spending, and she determined 20, over $27 billion of illegitimate expenses. And there, this was not a forensic audit. This was just a quick review and a preliminary uh, announcement on her part. $27.5 billion she quickly found of expenses that were hard to justify, unjustifiable. We're not talking about I understand we're dealing with billions of dollars in the government. So, you know, you can see a few hundred thousand dollars. You can see a few million dollars that need to be tightened up. $27.5 billion. It's mm -hmm. ludicrous. And it just adds to the malaise Canadians are feeling right now, story after story. I think they've become almost immune to the abuse of taxpayers' dollars by this Trudeau government. There's so many stories. And, of course, the mainstream media, and I say this uh, constantly, uh, thank God for platforms like streamers and podcasts like these, where we can get on and articulate these point of views and get them out on Twitter and get them out on Facebook and get them out on Snapchat and, and, and all these other platforms. So Canadians who are interested in fiscal responsibility and want to hold the government to account do so. I think we're turning the corner, honestly. I think Canadians have come to their wits end with the dog and pony show of this Trudeau government. Um, and I think there's an appetite for change. And I think the Conservative Party, it's it's up to us now to be responsible. And I'm excited because we have a fantastic new leader who's a great communicator. And I think if Pierre Polyev uh, offers the viable, responsible alternative to Canadians, which I know he will, I think we will have a change of government. It's a matter of time. I ultimately have faith in democracy, Costa. I have faith in the Canadian people, and I have faith in our institutions. And I know over the last seven years, a lot of Canadians, many watching us, I hope, uh, understand that don't lose faith. Uh, their, their, our, our system works. It's, it's cumbersome, arduous at times, and, and it's a long process. That's what democracy is. It was invented by Greeks, so obviously it would be complicated and not quick. <laughs> but uh, it does work in the end, and it's far better than all the other alternatives. So uh, I believe hope is on the way, but we have to do our part. People have to engage. They have to not turn off because of frustration, but turn on and, and follow and find out what is going on in Parliament with bills like C-11. Find out particularly, and you're right, we should be the most upset about the misuse and abuse of taxpayers' dollars, because all of us that pay taxes are hurt by that, and we contribute, and we see how hard it is today to balance our balance sheet. Yeah, look, I, I, I sincerely hope you're right about that. I, I agree. There's no better system than the, we, the one we have in place. Um, but at the same time, again, a, as an entrepreneur who, who's just, you know, seeing what, what's going on, like, I... I I feel like I'm slowly losing incentive to, to continue just like growing my business here in Canada, just because of the amount of just waste happening. Like, why am I working so hard and the government just like wasting all this, all this money? Like, it, it, I feel like the incentive is st starting to uh, diminish from not only myself, but a lot of other entrepreneurs as well. But, um, but I think your message is right. Like you now's the time to really, um, you know, push back and, and make things right. Um, so what, like, what's, what's your suggestion then to just the average Canadian? Like, how can we actually, you know, push back and, and turn things uh, around? First, first of all, like I said, follow the news, uh, make yourself aware. You started off by saying many Canadians are not aware about C-11. That's the kind of stuff that concerned me. Um, there's many Canadians that have become complacent. There's many Canadians, unfortunately, because things are so tough, have to work harder than ever before have to run and sprint to get things done more than ever before and don't have a lot of free time. But they got to take a step back and find out, hey, why are we running now uh, a debt of $1.7 trillion? Why is it that we have a government that promised in 2015 
to balance the budget and have only a temporary uh, deficit in 2015 uh, of three to four years lie to us. And yet they still got reelected in 2019, 2021. Uh, I think Canadians just have to take a step back and think and reflect because democracy only works when people participate. So that's the first thing. The second thing, those that are frustrated, please go to the website of the Conservative Party of Canada, take out a membership card. And you, if you believe in fiscal responsibility, if you believe in having a government that when they spend a new dollar of taxpayers' money, there's a they have to find the saving in another department, we're the party for you. If you believe uh, in a government that, for example, uh, reduces the tax load, be it goods and services taxes, income taxes, and puts more money back in the pockets of Canadians, we're the party for you. If you want a government that is accountable when a minister gives a contract to a family member without a public tender process, we need a prime minister who will hold that minister to account and fire them. Then the Conservative Party is the party for you. Um, if you want a prime minister who calls things for what they are, rather than constantly gaslighting Canadians, virtue signaling, race baiting, then we're the party for you. Um, so, you know, we, we cannot endure. We've had already almost eight years of the Trudeau government. And I know it's a partisan message, but I genuinely believe this. That's why I volunteer my time in the Conservative Party morning, noon and night, because I think we need change. We've had enough of the hall pass prime minister with, with taxpayers credit card uh, who believes he can spend his way out of all, all problems. Uh, try it at home with your families, with your you know, husbands and wives and children. Try to spend your way out of all your problems and try to spend your way into a, a state of utopia and see how, how far you're going to get. So I don't, I've never understood why governments think they can do it. Obviously, we know why, because you promise people who are unaware and disengaged all kinds of things that they believe short term will make them happy. And they don't look at the long term ramifications. And then we fall into the mess that we have fallen into. Yeah, you know, what? I, I agree with your message. The first point, especially about uh, just being aware, right? People need to more be more aware. And that's one of the, the main reasons why I have this podcast is to speak to people like yourself and just spread awareness and information, valuable information to other people and other Canadians. Um, but how, but the problem is with that, Leo, is the average person, right? They're working nine to five. They, being informed nowadays takes a lot of effort and time because, you know, the reality is for the vast majority of people, how they consume their news is going on social media, on Facebook, scrolling, reading headlines, not even clicking the article to read it, literally just reading the headlines, maybe the two lines underneath it. And what articles are they seeing? The, these government funded articles, right? Like from CBC, from from other, you know, mainstream outlets that are clearly biased and, and putting out a message. So so for that average person, like to be aware and informed is very difficult. Add Bill C-11 on top of that. Um, <laughs> How, how do you even be informed now, right? That's a challenge. Look, I, I, I don't totally, I don't totally agree with that. I believe it's easier to be informed today than ever before because of all these platforms. I know you're bombarded with a lot of information, and it requires some, um, a little bit more time, maybe, to analyze the information, right? But because of the capacity, of what we're doing here now, what you and I are doing. Because of this capacity over the last couple of decades, I believe people can be informed easier than ever before. My kids, who are obviously uh, once 26, once 23, they live in that digital streaming world and what have you. I find they're more informed at their age than I was because I had to sit down and make sure I didn't miss the 6 o'clock and 11 o'clock news back in the 1980s or else I would be completely uninformed, right? If I didn't pick up a copy of McLean's magazine and my local La Presse and Gazette that particular day, I was, uh, you know, I was a day behind on the news. Where today I'm on Twitter, I'm on Facebook. Uh, information flows very quickly. The problem is there's a lot of misinformation and a lot of propaganda that flows as well. And it requires people to be more diligent than ever before. Yeah. I think that's what it is. Once upon a time, people were spoon fed by these people powerful broadcasters. So propaganda was easier in a way for government in the past. And I think that's why 
uh, there's a lot of uh, people around the Trudeau entourage that miss those good old days. I think they're realizing that their traditional friends in the mainstream media have now competition. We have outlets where we can communicate and give our side of the story. And then it's up to Canadians to choose what they're comfortable with. Yeah. For me, it's a matter of choice. Any single time I can give choice to Canadians, consumers, uh, be it for broadcasting purposes, uh, goods and services that they that they buy, uh, choice is always good. Right? Yeah, th- that I totally agree with you. You're right in the sense that yeah, we we have more access access to information now than ever before. You can easily find what you're looking for if you spend the time to look. But I think the the problem is again, I'm speaking for for the general public who works at nine to five. They drive home. They're they're listening to the news. They come home. They have to make dinner. Like all you have time for is to literally just you know turn on the news, see the headlines. Like most people are not like you and me who, who maybe have extra time during the day to like do your own research. Like that's, I think a small percentage of, of the whole, but, um, but yeah, you're right. Well, it just takes the effort. Well, what has happened is I think there's a sense of hopelessness right now. I think a lot of Canadians uh, see the state of affairs in this country, our economy, a prime minister that's so divisive, um, you know, when a prime minister calls a bunch of protesters tinfoil fringe nut bars, essentially, and terrorists, uh, instead of taking a step back and, and listening to their concerns, uh, we're living in, in terrible times. And he continues to do it. He continues to gaslight and, and race bait people. Um, uh, that's who he is. That's and in a country as regionally, linguistically, ethnically, diverse as Canada. We know our challenges of having brought this country together and it's been an ongoing challenge to keep this country and our people united and to have a prime minister who is self, so self-serving, so partisan, uh, where uh, he will wedge groups and play one off against the other with absolutely no remorse, no, no, no. He never takes a step back and say, I should always put Canada first and my party and my political, personal interests second or third. And every prime minister before him, regardless of political color, when push came to shove and it was time to put Canada first, they put Canada first. Doesn't matter if it was John Chrétien or Brian Mulroney uh, or, or uh, Lester B. Pearson or John Diefenbaker. This is the first time I've seen a prime minister choose his interest, personal interests ahead of the interests of the country. And I've also never seen a prime minister in eight years, not acknowledge once so many of his shortcomings. And he's had many. So the fact that he couldn't find one to apologize for uh, and to correct uh, speaks volumes. Yeah, totally agree. Um, Leo, I I do want to be mindful of your time. You know, again, I I do thank you very much. As as a little disheartening, a lot of the things we spoke about were, at, at the end of the day, I think it's very important for, uh, like you said, right, this this is a system that works. Um, I think we, we just have to now just be more aware uh, of what's going on around us and uh, just be hopeful that and confident that that change is on the way, which uh, I think it is. I, I do at the end of the day still very much believe in this country and in the values it stands for. So um, we just got to keep, keep at it. Thank you, Costa. And, and you're absolutely right. And that's my message to our constituents who are, feeling hopeless and frustrated and angry. Uh, let's, uh, let's channel all that frustration and anger in a positive way, in a strategic way. Uh, let's communicate rationally. Let's work hard and make sure that next time around, we give Canadians a government that they deserve. And, and I believe we're on track to do so. Like I said, I'm working hard with our new leader, Pierre Polyev. And I've never been more uh, excited about the prospects, both for our country uh, and what we need to do to get it back on track. Yeah, me too. Well said. Senator, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. I'd love to do this again sometime. Speak to you soon. All right. Take take care. care.